On this episode, we chat with Michael Messner, the man behind the newly opened Pat Pong Museum. So if you're curious about the surprisingly complex history behind one of Bangkok's most notorious strips, you'll love this episode of the Bangkok Podcasts. Sawadee crap and welcome to the Bangkok Podcast. My name is Greg Jorgensen, a Canadian who came to Thailand in 2001 back when Sepan Taksin was the last BTS station because who would ever need to go to the Tonbury side on a train? No doubt. And I'm Ed Knuth, an American who came to Thailand on a one-year teaching contract 19 years ago, fell in love with Thailand Tom Jones, and I've never left. Oh yeah, sex bomb baby. We want to say a quick thank you to one of our patrons, Steve Brown, who supports us at the show shoutout level. Stick around afterward on talking about the very interesting Pat Pong Museum to hear why Steve might possibly one day represent Thailand in the Asian Games. Before we start, a huge thanks to all of our patrons who support the show. Patrons get a whole bunch of cool stuff, including our regular show a day early, behind the scenes photos and videos of our interviews, discounts on swag, which you can find on our website, and various other things that aren't available to regular listeners. But best of all, patrons also get an unscripted, uncensored bonus episode every week where we riff on current events and random topics. We just finished recording this week's bonus show, and, a- and after a visit to Pat Pong for this show just last night, we decided the infamous soy needed a bit more discussion. So we chatted about our first memories of Pat Pong, how it's changed over the years, and a few insights, both negative and positive, that we didn't end up getting to when we did our interview at the museum. To become a patron, head to bangkokpodcast.com forward slash support. Sick bomb, sick bomb. Yo, my sex bomb. That's a great song. Canadian Tom Jones. <laughs> sex bomb, eh? Oh, God. <laughs> All right. Well, in this episode, uh, as you may have guessed, we chat to Michael Messner, the man behind the recently opened Pat Pong Museum. Now, if you know anything about Bangkok, you know that Pat Pong is known for basically two things, shopping and go-go bars. But the short soy that runs between Silom and Surawong Roads actually has an incredibly vivid history that goes back way before any girls started dancing. Once one of Bangkok's main business districts, Pat Pong spent its early days as the Asian headquarters for some of the world's biggest corporations and generated stories about CIA spies, Vietnam War heroes, and family power struggles, all of which is covered in amazing detail in Michael's Museum. So here is our gin and tonic fueled conversation with Michael Messner at the Pat Pong Museum. All right, well, we are here at the Pat Pong Museum in lovely Pat Pong, Bangkok. We are sitting in the back at the end of our cool little tour uh, at a bar. We are sipping uh, delicious gin tonics. Ed, cheers. Cheers. Michael, cheers. We're here with Michael Messner, the owner, proprietor, originator of the Pat Pong Museum. Michael, welcome to the Bangkok Podcast. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to the Pat Pong Museum. Wow, oh, thank you. It's great. And cheers. Cheers, Both indeed. You, gentlemen. For sure. Mm. Now, it's really cool that uh, that you're on because when this place opened, I think I think a lot of people hear the Pat Pong Museum and they think like, ah, oh, it's just going to be nothing but nipples and gross stuff. But there is so much more to Pat Pong than I think what people know about. And I thought you'd be a great guy to to get on to talk about that because you've been here a long time. You're you you know this area very well. So can you give us like a quick rundown of uh, who you are and how you ended up in Thailand and what your association with Pat Pong is. Absolutely. Um, I arrived in uh, Bangkok the first time, 1996 and then 1997. So right during the financial crisis, um, looking for places that could cast bronze sculptures um, for arts, artists. That was my my, my main trade at the time and it, worked very well. I had a chance as a young man, as a young entrepreneur to to make good money. And so early 2000, I decided to spend some of that money uh, in the country where 
part of a value add came from. So I, I took her three months off and uh, came to Thailand, came to Bangkok, uh, met uh, a lady, not in Pat Pong. <laughs> <laughs> and that lady, 20 years later, is still with me. Um, she's now the mother of my children. And uh, when she got pregnant, I was like, okay, I need to have some kind of business here that is not a project business with long cycles of expense and then making money. A daily a business that makes money every day. And I was much younger than I, was, than I am today. So a bar, of course. And uh, coincidence, uh, through her family, a relationship into Pat Pong, to one of what I would call a real, in the best, most positive meaning of the word, a real godfather, like none are around today anymore. Pretty old school, but also very wise men. And uh, I met him and he became my mentor. I dedicate a wall here in the museum to him. His nickname was Lung Widget, Uncle Widget. And uh, he uh, was a figure of yeah, great, he commanded great respect here in the area. And he introduced me to Pat Pong, he introduced me to Thailand in general, into culture, the do's and don'ts, even into Buddhism. He found me a temple where there's an English speaking abbot, these kind of things. And uh, I, today I understand actually that because of him and because the people here in Pat Pong saw me under his protection, I actually had a chance <laughs> to to develop some roots here and to build a business. Um, so in would... general, I don't know anything about it. In, in general, Michael, is it is it hard to buy a bar in Pat Pong? Is it quite difficult? Is it kind of a closed system? I think it's not so hard to buy a bar in Pat Pong, but it's very hard to keep it. Well, wh why is that? Because you have all these leeches, all these mosquitoes and all these bad things that will happen that make you pay for this and pay for that and you won't know why you're suddenly fighting all these things coming up i've, I've seen it so many times and and, uh, and how you step on people's toes and they don't like it because there is no guide on how to do business in pat pong so but you were lucky you had a mentor to help you out yes and i didn't know and i didn't understand um, and yeah, the first three years I also lost money, but uh, to the tune where I was, it was, it was a very simple bar, the Target pool bar and restaurant in Pat Pong Soi Tu, ground floor place with just pool and burgers. And uh, it was 2002, total different time. Bangkok was a different place. And so you've sort of thrived here since then and eventually leading to the museum. and. The museum is sort of a labor of love, I guess, on your part, to showcase sort of the, some of, the, some of your experience and memories and history of this place? When, uh, in, in, in 2004, 2005, I started to understand the bigger picture. I started to understand that um, the CIA had a presence here, that corporate America had a presence here, um, that that's a story worth to be told. So I, I felt this has to be done. This story has to be told. Nobody knows about that. And it, it, it was a mission since, since 2006. You know, uh, just for our listeners' sake, uh, you probably have heard of Pat Pong or know of it as a red light district, which of course it is. But uh, as Michael is pointing out, it has a, a fascinating history that, I mean, I think a fairly significant part of Bangkok's history. And we, we don't want to give the whole story away. In fact, that's the purpose of the museum. If you come here, uh, uh, the museum actually walks you through the entire history. But it goes back uh, more than 100 years, probably more than like 130 years. And uh, it's an incredible history that, as Michael pointed out, involves a lot of crazy characters and uh, just, just things you would never expect before it even became a red light district. Yeah, and I think we can. Well, we're not, there's no spoilers here. We're not letting the cat out of the bag. But really quickly, Pat Pong used to be a banana plantation, and it was eventually uh, turned into a strip of commercial properties, and some shop houses were built, and it just grew up and up and up from there. But long before the 
the the titty bars ever came in and like the red lights and the go-go bars and stuff like that um it was it was a legit sort of cbd the central business district of this area of bangkok and can you talk a little bit about what it was like back in those days who was here and what the what the vibe was like absolutely um one of the family members of the pat pong family of the landlord happened to be educated in the united states and been exposed and seeing uh, western business and property development so with that knowledge um, he arrived here in thailand in 1945 just after the war and uh, he clearly understood that bangkok lacks any real central business district and what pat pong really is is pat pong is the nucleus of the central business district this is where it began not on silom road or saton road it's pat pong road that uh, was home to the first large american and in other international businesses um, like ibm the building we are in uh, is the ibm headquarter of uh, uh, ibm in thailand yeah you know um, this is something that i did not know uh, even though i've been the co-host of the bangkok podcast for three years almost um, i didn't know that I, i knew that i knew that there was some connection between the cia and pat pong Uh, but I had no idea that this essentially was the central business district for a while. If you wanted to travel, um, you came to Papong Road to buy your tickets here because all the airlines, TWA, Pan Am, uh, Japan Airline, uh, Air France, Qantas, they were all here. Um, the news, where, where would the news arrive? Uh, the, 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 the telegraph cables and the, new, the, the news line tickers of Associated Press and UPI, they, they, they were here on Papong Road. So if you connect all these dots, you have not this rest and recreation American GI soldiers here at all. You have a business community here. You have pilots here. You have uh, hidden among them Lots of spooks and agents here, journalists. So a very sophisticated, secretive, um, lone warrior scene. Right. And of course, what they want besides the office and, and the good infrastructure for their work, they also want um, supplementary infrastructure of good bars, restaurants, nightclubs, Not red light as such, but uh, something where they can hang out and be right. with friends. A good part of the tour and the uh, exhibits in the museum deals with a guy named Tony Poe. And a lot of people might not know who he is, but he was largely assumed to be the basis for Colonel Kurtz in Apocalypse Now. He was sort of this like rough and tumble American who was... Ex-Army, ex-CIA, I'm not sh sure how it all fits together. Can you talk a little bit about him and why he plays such a big part in early Pat Pong, like in the 60s and 70s? Um, so Tony Poe is a very controversial person. Um, we do feature him in a museum because through this person, uh, we can bring something that's now already way past in history and kind of starts to become a bit anonymous and synthetic, the Vietnam War. Through Tony Poe, we can, we can bring the Vietnam War kind of to life and the horrors and, and uh, the tears and the bombs and all of that gets a face. Tony Poe works for the CIA and uh, the CIA has an airline and it's the not so well known civil air transport that has its office on Papong Road in the 50s. And during that time, it's CAT airline that, uh, for example, provides arms to General Chiang Kai-shek, the Chinese Civil War, that uh, provides support to the Dalai Lama when he's on the way from Tibet to India. And Tony Po is involved in these operations. And basically, civil air transport flies Tony Po from A to B. So when he checks in and gets ready to fly, he comes to Pat Pong. Now, CAT is later on merged into Air America, which again has its offices on Pat Pong Road. 
And uh, Tony Poe is being piloted by Air America in and out on his missions in the secret war uh, into Laos and Cambodia. So at the, at, at the peak of his uh, active career in, during the Vietnam War, Tony Poe commands thousands of Mon people, ethnic Mon people, um, that believe he is a, a god because he can make it rain, fire or rice depending on what he <laughs> wow. wires, uh, what, what, what he speaks into the microphone. A very controversial figure. However, when America then withdraws from the war and is moving out of Vietnam and the whole thing is lost, they are dropping these local ethnic minorities that were fighting for them like hot potatoes and they don't care. And they are basically being target for ethnic cleansing and extermination by the Pate Lao, the communists. And it's Tony Poe who puts all his weight and pulls all the strings he can to bring them into the United States, these Hmong people, that they're being evacuated, airlifted out of Laos uh, over to the States. And he, he passed away as a very well-respected member of the Mon exilees in the United States. And he's, I mean, you've got to come to the museum to check it out, but there's all these crazy stories about him, about how he, the, him and his soldiers used to wear necklaces made of human ears to prove how many enemies they've killed. And he used to drop the heads of, of, of enemies out of airplanes onto enemy villages to sort of intimidate them and sort of spread the word far and wide that he's not to be messed with. You know, all these crazy stories. And this was a really crazy time in Southeast Asia because like you said, the Americans were pulling out of Vietnam and Thailand was seen as one of the sort of central pillars in the in the prevention of communism spreading in Southeast Asia. Is that right, Ed? I mean, you know more about this than I do, but it was a pretty tumultuous time. Yeah, I mean, everyone knows that Thailand was a Western ally and essentially this is where we drew the line. Uh, and, and to, you know, we became a huge ally of Thailand to stop the spread of communism. And it's amazing how far back the alliance goes. I mean, right after World War II, uh, you know, an alliance was formed that really has lasted until today. So it's, it's a little bit of uh, Bangkok trivia, but Pat Pong is owned by the Pat Pong Pandit family. And you, you come to the museum, you'll find a really interesting history of, you know, where they came from and how they evolved and how they owned this land and et cetera, et cetera. It's a great story. But Pat Pong is still a privately owned strip of land worth quite a bit of money, which we were discussing earlier. And we were, we were talking about how eventually someone's going to get an, a, enough dump trucks worth of money to, to buy it out from under the Pet Pongpanit family. I'm sure eventually it has to happen, but who knows? But they started Pat Pong as sort of a commercial enterprise. They didn't have go-go bars and nightlife in mind when, when they started. It just sort of happened that way. So can you talk about how, how that industry sort of the seed for it and how it grew up and became to sort of be what Pat Pong is known for? The big corporates soon this strip became too small for them. So to, during the Vietnam War, this infrastructure here is not good enough. So they are starting to vacate out of here. Shell moves out, Caltex moves out, um, and places become available. Now, due to this secret war, there's a lot of funny money around and people made quite some fortunes and they like to spend it quick as well. So they buy bars, they open bars, they are here. And it is uh, Rick Menard, for example, a person that you will learn more about when you come to the museum, who opened the bar uh, called the Grand Prix Bar. He started as a sports bar. And by chance, this sports bar becomes a go-go bar. And that's because the go-go bar a stage where females dance presents a loophole in the licensing and the law of the time. So it was okay to have that. You didn't need a license for that. And that kicks off the go-go revolution here, which you will learn in the detail of this great anecdote of how this really happened and how Rick understood, okay, let's have go-go bars. And then it comes very quickly. Then the Mississippi Queen opens, later on then peppermint and all these go-go bars here. While at that time then you have more international tourists coming, Thailand is not destroyed by the war, it's a great destination. 
tourists come, Pat Pong is famous, you have stars coming here, you have David Bowie coming here. So one hand shakes the other and... When, when did the market come into play? When was that first built up? The, the market came into play when the Pat Pong family raised for the first time in many years the rents. The tenants couldn't cope with it. And then a compromise was kind of struck that, okay, we won't raise the rates as much but we will rent out the street to a night market. And that is in 1994. Only 94. in 1994, wow. I had no idea it was that recent. I thought it would go back way further than that. And listeners, in case you don't know, Pat Pong uh, is famous for being a red light district, but it's also famous for a huge crowded night market. So the entire soy uh, is a market at night, which is a, a big tourist destination. I mean, Pat Pong was almost known as well for that market as it is for the red light district, I think. Today, I'd say the, the Pat Pong night market is probably what in the general uh, perception, that's what Pat Pong is famous for, the tourists that come here. Given where Bangkok stands today with the regulations of stalls and vendors on the street, it's also the only night market in this central uh, business area here between Sukhumvit and, and Silom as the Suan Lum and these things disappeared. Um, many, many of the patrons of the old times, they really don't like it. Um, my take at it is we can't imagine Pat Pong as ever being what it used to be in the 70s and 80s. And anyone who's trying that, that's a lost cause because it doesn't make any sense. Pat Pong is reinventing itself. I think today, again, turning the page one more time, and I think the museum plays a crucial part of it. It's kind of a catalyst of this change into something, the next step after the go-go bars, after the night market, what's next? It's maybe more food, more attractions for couples, um, more culture in a way, but maybe fun culture um, in that way. Well, I was going to ask, do you, do you feel like the kind of red light nature of Pat Pong is, is on kind of a decrease or decline? I wouldn't say on a decline as such, because there's just a new go-go bar that opened, and um, so one, there's one in the making. But there is new concepts that come into this area, into Pat Pong. The Irish pubs are doing really good. They're very popular. Um, smaller venues with live music. So P Pat Pong in general is uh, alive and well. It's doing well, would you say? I think there are some people here in Pat Pong that have been doing extremely well over the last years. Um, there are places, especially those that keep on doing what they have been doing the last 30 years, that are doing not so well. Uh, who, have, um, who haven't adapted or changed what right. they're doing. It's interesting you talk about that, the, the, the golden years and stuff, because I'm sure everyone, you know, every generation says that, oh, you should have seen this place in, when I was a kid. And then 10 years later, someone will say the exact same thing. And every, like, every 10 years, someone says that. But, you know, my very first night in Bangkok in July 2001, I came to Pat Pong. And uh, I was on a tour, and we saw a Thai Tom Jones at the, he's no longer there. And we bought some cheap lingerie on the side of the street, and we threw it at Thai Tom Jones, and he loved it. And it, it seemed to me a much more rowdy place back then. Um, so I, I would be the one, my golden years of Pat Pong would be like back in the early 2000s. Right. Um, and, but, you know, and like you said, it's changing now. You've got uh, just across the street and you've got a brown, so the corner of Soy Convent, they're building a giant new office building. Um, old standbys have gone and have been replaced by chain restaurants and like you said, Irish pubs now. So it's, it's you know, I think Pat Pong is sort of a microcosm of Bangkok itself as it's, it's got a lot of people who have been here a long time, but it's also constantly, constantly turning over and changing. Let me say this. Uh, Bangkok is famous for how fast the bars and restaurants and nightlife changes. Uh, and of course, that's true in Pat Pong. But it's also a place where you can see bars that have been open for 10, 20, 30 years, which is kind of cool. So some of the bars on Pat Pong are, are, are maybe not original, but I mean, they've been around for 20 or 30 years. Well, there's many places that date back 20 years. There are two or three places that date back into the Vietnam War, wow. even with the same owners. There's not many places in Bangkok like that. Absolutely. There really aren't. I Absolutely. mean, Bangkok is famous for its turnover. 
And that's what I, I think differentiates and makes Pat Pong so unique. It's not this central managed uh, Disneyland for adults, like maybe some other entertainment areas in Bangkok. This is a grown and evolved, uh, very authentic place with all, and I think with and due to all of this history. Right, it has history, it has a real history. Well, as we're wrapping up here, let's let's finish up with some more talk about the museum. Um, I saw earlier, I, I've, this is the second time I've been here, and when I, when I came out earlier, I saw that there was a whole bunch of new photos and new paintings and artwork about the front. So you said how this bar itself is always changing and evolving. So do you, do you see it sort of continuing to grow and adapt over time? Oh, absolutely. The museum, the way it's conceptualized is, yes, we tell a hundred years of history through the lens and through the eyes of Pat Pong, um, but it's alive. So we're adding layers. There's lots of friendly people that reach out to us and uh, add things, donate things, lend things, exhibits. Um, there's some very famous uh, people of the golden days that uh, played a big role there that are actually coming by next week that bring things um, from that time, legendary calendars and pinups and so on. So we plan on adding layer by layer, uh, adding also more interactive things into the exhibition. This is not supposed to be a one dimensional experience. This is supposed to be interactive and fun. Um, and in that way, we will continue to build the collection and the experience more and more rich. And uh, this month we have started with something new. The Papong Museum expanded into uh, an outlet also on Papong Road where we do contemporary art exhibitions uh, that change frequently, maybe once a month. Um, we just had the opening last uh, Saturday of one exhibition of an Italian photographer who followed a dominatrix out of one of the Papong fetish clubs on her journey back to her hometown in Isan. And the photography of that we exhibited, it was a great success. We sold some uh, pieces and many, many nice friends came and, and took a look. Um, next uh, month, we're gonna bring a, quite a famous Thai artist who is doing minute portraits of Papong workers um, and so forth. Well, let me say this. Uh, 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 obviously, Greg and I thank you very much for letting us come here, and we really appreciate this interview. And, you know, it's normal anytime we have a guest to uh, uh, promote uh, their business because we have great guests and uh, we always mean it. But let me tell you this. Uh, the Pat Pong Museum is it's just not where you expect it's going to be. It's just way more, uh, I don't know, thorough. And I don't know, I found it surprising. I mean, that's like, like I... I, I feel like I learned a lot. Like it's genuinely interesting and the history of Pat Pong just has twists and turns that I knew nothing about. Yeah, totally. And you, you, you know, you see a lot of, a lot of care has been put into the exhibitions and the, you know, uh, your guide earlier was telling us a story about how one of the original restaurants chucked out their old sign, like their original sign and, and you, you went to the garbage and you're like, hey, you know, you know, we'll, we'll take that. You know, like you've put a lot of work into actually really capturing a moments in time throughout the hundred plus years of Pat Pong and it shows it's great. A lot of work has been put into it and it's, it's, it's really a surprising, mostly family friendly place. I'd say the first 75% is family friendly. The back part here, maybe not so much, but, but anyone can come and it's, it's really cool. So yeah, thank you so much for letting us sit down. And, uh, and uh, we, uh, when we have friends in town, we'll bring them back. I thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity to introduce the museum. Uh, to your listeners and what I wanted to offer uh, to all the listeners of the Bangkok podcast. So if you come here and you want to buy a ticket, you just call the code word Bangkok podcast and you'll get uh, the best rate for walk-ins. Wow. Uh, Damn, we didn't a, even plan this. That's great. <laughs> which is a 20% discount on the normal walk-in rate. All right. Bangkok podcast listeners, mention Bangkok podcast when you buy a ticket. There you go. Awesome. Well, thank you, Michael. We really appreciate it and continued success. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Bye-bye. Well, I got to say that was one of the more interesting interviews we've done. And I know I said it in the interview, but uh, 
the Pat Pop Museum is definitely worth visiting. It's a little bit off the beaten path. And, you know, most of our listeners, all of you guys out there, uh, most of you guys are not total newbies in Thailand. You've probably done temples and things like that. And if you're looking for something new, uh, like we said, it's definitely worth a visit. Wouldn't you say, Greg? Yeah, totally. I think it's a real, I, you know, I was surprised because, you know, you hear Pat Pong Museum and almost everyone I've told that to has been like, what? There's a museum in Pat Pong? You know, because you think right. of museums, you think of antiques and, you know, old art and statues and stuff like this. But, you know, this this is still a slice of Bangkok's history, just of a specific street that happened to be known for all these, all these things. So, um, yeah, he put a lot of work into the museum. It's it's bright, it's well lit, it's shiny. The tour makes a lot of sense, and he's got a lot of really cool artifacts and souvenirs yeah. and mementos. I, I gotta say, uh, I gotta say, it was pretty cool of him to offer a discount to our listeners. So, listeners, uh, you heard it in the interview, but uh, what it basically boils down to about a twenty percent discount. Is that right? Something like that. Yeah, a special discount for Bangkok podcast listeners. Yeah. So, if you head down to the museum, make sure you uh, mention the Bangkok podcast. And the other uh, little bit of a warning is, uh, like we said, about the last twenty or twenty-five percent of it is pretty adult. Uh, so it's probably not suitable for children, or I guess they could. Children could uh, check out the early part of it and then not enter the. There is kind of like a red light zone at the end of the museum. Yeah, full on, full on boobies and everything else, and uh, maybe cover the kids' eyes as they walk by. But other than that, it's family friendly. I would say. Yeah, yeah. At least the first part of it is family friendly. Yeah, yeah. Right. Good times, and thanks to Michael for coming on the show. It was really nice sitting down with him, and he. Uh, and man, those gin and tonics were good in the bar. I highly recommend them. all right let's get into some love loathe or live with where one of us picks a particular aspect of life in bangkok which we then discuss and decide if it's something we love about living here loathe about living here or have come to accept as something that we just have to learn to live with no matter how we feel about it and this week it is my turn now ed uh, you eat food i do eat food you're vegetarian but i still technically food (laughs) yes that's right it is technically food that's right um but what do you think of this What's your feeling when you walk into a restaurant, meet some friends, hey, let's go to this restaurant. Oh, it's, I heard it's really good. Okay, great. And you walk in and they say, okay, here's your table. And there are no chairs. It's just a low table with pillows you sit on, on the floor. Ah, uh, interesting. Uh, you know, it, obviously this varies considerably with the type of restaurant it is. Like, so this yeah. is not super com- This is not super common. It kind of depends on the type of table. True. Uh, but I was just in this exact situation last week. Uh, we oh, yeah. were at a veg. We were at a veggie place uh, near Kaosan Road, and uh, the only tables open were where you had to sit on the floor, you know, on a cushion on the floor. Yeah. And here's my answer: I like it. I'm into it. Really? Uh, I got no. I got no problems with it. There's something kind of just chilled out. It's like I guess it's kind of semi hippie-ish. I don't know. Like I like it. But it turns out that the, my buddy who I was with, uh, he's got kind of back issues and he's, he was like a no-go. So he, 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 he would be like a loathe. He's like, he can't, he was like, I can't do that. So we had to leave and wait for like a proper table so we could get a chair for his back. Yeah. Um, so I totally get how some people don't like it. But for me, I'm, I'm that kind of guy. I'm, I'm, I'm a floor sitter, man. I got no problem with sitting on the floor. <laughs> You're a floor sitter. Interesting. I'm, I'm on the exact sitter. same page as your buddy. I'm a hard loathe. Uh, I, I I really hate it. I think it's terribly uncomfortable. But this is probably my fault because if I weighed 30 kilograms less and I have a bad back, um, it probably wouldn't be that much of a big deal. But just like your friend, sitting on the cushion on the floor after 10 minutes, for me, it's excruciating. It's really painful. And I oh, hate it. Oh, interesting. I hate it. Interesting. I can't do it. I like it. I mean, I like just sitting there with cross legs and I don't know, it's just kind of homey, you know? And, you know, I guess, I mean, is it, Presumably, it's a traditional Thai thing, I guess. Yeah, well, but you know, you've obviously seen Thais. I mean, they, they whip out a blanket and throw it on the ground. Bam, there's your dinner yeah. table. You know, they just sit on the, on the floor. <laughs> um, yeah. Bam, bam dinner there's table. your dinner table. <laughs> <laughs> bam, there's your sometime. I guess I'm just more Thai than you are, Greg. I, I guess so. You've assimilated much. Well, you have been here a year longer than I have, so maybe next year is going to be my year. <laughs> well, speaking of assimilate, you know, it's funny you, you mentioned that because I was thinking about this the other day. I remember when I first got here and I saw people putting ice in beer and I was and I, and I remember thinking I will never do that. And yeah. I, 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 it's funny. I wish I could remember. I don't remember when I started to do that, but I definitely do that. You don't remember the, you know? the first time as you like dropped it in slow motion, like the, that, like 
like eek, 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 horror music plays. I was probably hoping no one from Ohio was looking, you know, <laughs> as I dropped the ice cube in the beer. But yeah, uh, yeah. so I guess I, I, I put ice in my beer and I sit on the floor. What can I say? Well, I'm indifferent to the ice in the beer, but I'm a definite loathe on the sitting on the floor. Can't do it. Gotcha, gotcha. So, as we mentioned at the beginning of the show, we'd like to say thank you to Steve Brown for lending us his support at the show shout-out level. And Greg, what did you find out about Steve? Well, Steve is one of our, uh, our less, uh, I don't want, I would say less verbal, but that doesn't sound very good. I, I sent a message to Steve and he replied back with a very nice email, but he didn't give me a lot of details on himself. Ah, okay. So, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Steve is, uh, is from New Zealand. I've heard of him. <laughs> yeah, he's from this place called, I'm going to probably butcher this. I'm going to see if I can play it. Mount Monganui, Mount Monganui. Gotcha. Or something like that, yeah. And uh, and Steve said he's a big supporter of anything rugby league. Have you ever played rugby? I've never played rugby. Uh, I'm familiar somewhat with the game, but uh, never played. Yeah, man. I, I mean, of all the sports I watch, uh, rugby looks like the most brutal and badass of them all. Yeah. It's kind of like American football, but with no pads. Right, right. Because like the br- most brutal sport I know of is American football, but everyone's wearing 30 kilograms of pads to protect yeah, I'm themselves. With I'm with I'm you. I'm with you. I'm not saying it's easy, but these these rugby nut houses they go out there with nothing. So, yeah. you know, and, and Steve said he's heading to Thailand uh, this year in a few months, and he can't wait. Um, he said, love the show. Looking forward to the bonus show. So we hope you like the bonus show, Steve. But I got to thinking, since Steve is obviously such a badass sports player, while he's here, he should learn how to play takra. Oh, wow. That'd be great. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? He, he might end up being a great takra player. Yeah, because takra, like, like, think of it. Rugby has a weird ball. Takra has a weird ball. It's just this wicker orb. And rugby, you're flying all over the place and, and doing all these weird contortions to get away from people. Yeah. Takra, yeah. you're jumping up in the air and spiking the ball over the net with your foot. So, uh, Steve, I think if you practice and use that dedication you bring to uh, rugby and learn how to play takra, you might even be able to play on the Thai national team and compete in the Asian games, which is like the Olympics of takra. You never know. I agree. Yeah. Takra for him. I agree. That's right. Steve, when you uh, spike that ball over the net with your foot, do a 360 in the air and land like superhero style, like Iron Man slow motion, me and Ed will be <laughs> in the audience cheering, cheering you on, man. That's right. We'll be cheering you on. That's right. <laughs> Thanks for your support, buddy. We appreciate it. And uh, yeah, look, at, look us up when you're in town when you come come to Thailand this year. A final thanks to our patrons who help keep the show ad-free. Patrons get a ton of cool perks and the warm, fuzzy feeling knowing that they're helping support the show. Find out more by clicking support on our website. And connect with us online. We're Bangkok Podcast on social media, bangkokpodcast.com on the web, or simply bangkokpodcast at gmail.com. We love hearing from our listeners and always reply to our messages. Yeah, you can also listen to each episode on YouTube, chat with us online, or even reach out to me directly on Twitter, uh, where I'm Bangkok Greg, BKK Greg. Thank you for listening, folks, and we'll see you back here next week. We just finished recording this week's bonus show, and after a visit to Pat Pong for this show just last night, for this for this show just now, okay, hold on, let me get the gotta get the the emphasis yeah, down. Yeah. We just finished recording this week's bonus show, and after a visit to. Uh, <laughs>